North London East End. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay, members. Um, Nick, Nick, are you on in here, Nick? Nick, are you online? I just want to double check. Okay. I just need confirmation that we are in open session. Yes, Tecum, we're now in open session. Right. Uh, thank you. Okay, members, um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the, the weekly meeting. Um, could you maybe just, um, if you just go into mute, until you're ready to speak, because there's a bit of background noise interfering. Uh, we have a quorum here today, and uh, we, we, by looking around the room here, we have at least five members. Uh, if you have any issues, folks, with Starleaf, uh, you can either let it known through the, the WhatsApp facility. Um, also, we know from uh, previous meetings, keep your microphones muted until you're ready to speak. Uh, you know, so should should any uh, members wish to speak, just let me know use this uh, using the WhatsApp facility. Okay, and you know the the committee will be brought the committee meeting will be broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online, and you can use your mobile devices so long as they're in airplane mode and all devices muted. So the first item that I have written here on the agenda is apologies. We don't have any uh, apologies listed for today. Uh, the second item is chairperson's business. Um, I have none listed here today. Uh, and the third item is a draft minutes. I want to refer members to the draft minutes from the meeting on the 13th of May at page six. Are members okay with the draft minutes? You can just do a nod there and I'll be able to see. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to sign the minutes then. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, do, I'm operating uh, virtually here today, but I will sign the, the minutes on Monday when I'm back in Parliament buildings. Item four on the agenda, um, I'm going to ask, uh, as matters arising, Nick, I'm going to ask you to brief the committee on the launch of the committee's call for evidence for the climate change bill using citizen space. So, Nick, uh, you can you do uh, the Hugo brief on the citizen space, the publication in the local papers, our communication strategy, press release, and indeed the invitation to stakeholders to uh, give oral evidence. So, Nick, do you want to do your briefing there? Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, um, you'll recall that uh, last week we um, discussed the construction of the template to go on uh, citizen space for the call for evidence and views um, on the Climate Change Bill. Um, and thank you to members for their time given during the week to review that. It's just to confirm that as of today, that link on citizen space is now live and therefore the call for evidence um, is now open and that will be open for a period of eight weeks. Um, in terms of how that notice will be advertised, um, the, uh, I confirmed last week with the Assembly communications team that the standard policy approach within the Assembly is to advertise the notice um, in the three main publications of the Belfast Telegraph, the Irish News and the Newsletter. Um, however, in order to supplement that, there is a general press release that has been uh, put forward in the table pack and that press release will go out to all media outlets, um, including local publications. And therefore, that is the strategy that is normally adopted to advertise the calls for evidence. In terms of a further communication strategy to um, direct stakeholders towards the call for evidence, this afternoon, um, the Assembly will be issuing via social media outlets um, emotional video, which our chairperson very kindly filmed last week. Um, and um, as soon as those messages go out, I would um, seek the support of members of the committee to use their networks on social media to retweet and share that message so that we can promote awareness of the call for evidence session. Um, and then further discussions with the communications team. Uh, they plan to monitor the number of responses we get via the citizen space template over the coming weeks. And potentially use other messages and directed um, messages at certain groups in order to encourage responses. So I suppose in the weeks ahead, I'll keep members updated on the number of responses that we receive via the citizen space template and any further me uh, measures that may be taken um, to promote awareness. And then just finally, just to note that we have the committee team this week has commenced the process of inviting the agreed list of stakeholders to give oral evidence to the committee in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Chair.
Members, uh, are members okay with that uh, call for evidence uh, with the, the, the proposals outlined by Nick there? Um, and can I just also uh, re reiterate the uh, message that Nick said there that um, that we should all use our own networks and our own social media and our own contacts to encourage as, as wide a uh, response as possible to, uh, to this uh, call for evidence on this uh, important piece of legislation. Okay, members, so um, we're going to move on now to item five on the agenda. And that's an oral an oral briefing uh, from the Research and Information Services on proposals for a farm welfare bill. Uh, so, um, so I want to refer members to the research paper at page fifteen of your packs. And I'd like to welcome Mark Allen, the research officer here today. And I'd like to ask, uh, um, invite Mark to um, uh, commence the, the the briefing, and then there'll be questions afterwards. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. And as you said, um, I suppose the briefing is on pages 15 to 33 in your pack. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm proposing to give you, as, as we would normally do, a summary of the main issues uh, within the paper that we are, are, would think are merit consideration, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the paper itself, I suppose, provides an overview of the proposed draft bill. Um, it provides some contextual information in relation to farm price provisions or interventions in a number of jurisdictions. And then, as I said, there's a discussion of potential points for consideration on both a general and then a more specific basis. Um, it should be noted, I suppose, and it goes without saying, that the contents of the briefing paper do not constitute legal advice uh, and they should not be used on that basis. And just by another uh, way of context, a contextual statement, I think it's important to say that we, we completed this paper on the basis that this was a bill that had been introduced to the House. We didn't take a pre-legislative uh, approach. It's an unusual form in the sense that it's come drafted. So that was the, the, the way that we looked at it. Um, ordinarily, something like this would appear through a PMB or executive, there may be some preliminary work. I have completed a paper on the basis of the assumption that this has been introduced, even though it hasn't. So uh, hopefully that clarifies um, the approach that we have taken. Um, the early part of the paper looks at the challenges for, for local farmers. I'm not going to rehearse or revise or go over those again. As a committee, you're well aware of the challenges uh, around farm incomes, around fairness in the food supply chain, and around volatility in farm prices. Um, and we've extensively covered those in a range of papers, so I thought better to actually commit our time to looking at the actual content of the proposed draft bill. The bill that's presented then to the committee is titled as the Farm Welfare Northern Ireland, uh, Farm Welfare Bill Northern Ireland, and has a stated aim of preventing damage to the welfare of farming businesses in Northern Ireland by making provisions about the prices for farm produce. In terms of the specific content, uh, the, the bill is made up of six sections. Section one is a, a fair farm gate price index, and there's five subsections there. Section 2 looks at the Fair Farm uh, Gate Pricing Panel with eight subsections. Section 3 looks at minimum pricing. There's six sub subsections there. Section 4 looks at anti-avoidance provisions with six subsections. Section 5 is commencement and transitional, three subsections. And then Section 6 deals with issues around interpretation. The detail around uh, what each subsection does within the proposed draft bill is set out on table one in your papers, uh, and that's pages 17 to 19. I'm not going to provide an overview beyond this, um, as I am constrained on time, and uh, my general and specific comments really, I suppose, identify any of the potential issues that we thought merited raising um, in relation to the actual content. I suppose just by, by further means of context before we get into the bill proper, um, there is a section there, as you can see, uh, around farm produce price provisions in other jurisdictions. That's on pages uh, 19 to 21 on your paper, table 2. And what we really sought to do there was give you an overview of market price interventions of various types across a range of selected OECD countries. That data, I should say, too, is taken from the OECD's Agricultural Policy Monitoring and Evaluation Report for 2020. Again, I'm not going to dwell on these. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions or, or if you want to ask me to go away and find out more on them, I'm um, happy to do so. But I suppose the, the, there's a range of examples there. Canada, just one I picked at random, 
You can see the sorts of things that are employed there. They have a supply management system, provides market price support to the dairy, poultry and egg sectors, mainly through tariffs and production quotas. And they also have a system of domestic price setting according to production costs. There's a range of other ones there. Some of the ones, for example, in the EU you would know uh, through previous iterations, private storage aid and others. I suppose the thing I want to say is it, it is clear from the data presented in Table 2 that market price interventions are employed across a range of OECD countries and for a range of products. Whilst the, the levels of intervention might vary considerably, this does establish that there are precedents for either setting minimum prices for farm produce or for acting when prices fall below a particular threshold. However, and I, I need to stress this, the OECD analysis of the data reveals the following trends across its member countries. And I, I'm quoting here, the way support is delivered to producers has also evolved. In particular, the development and support to agriculture in the OECD area is characterised by the long-term decline of support based on commodity output. That includes market price support and output payments. OECD work has identified this form of support as having the strongest potential to distort agricultural production and trade. And I suppose in summary, there are other things that are listed there by recommendation. I'm not going to dwell on those. You're, you're able to read them. Whilst direct market price inter inter interventions undoubtedly exist, the OECD is of the opinion that there should be a move away from such mechanisms across their member countries. So with that contextual um, work completed, I want to just then turn to the actual bill itself. And pages 22 to 29 of the paper actually deal with general issues. The first of which I want to look at, and I think it's a, a fairly crucial one, is, is the bill compliant with the UK Competitions Act 1998? The Competition Act has provisions designed to prohibit practices which lead to agreement, business practice or conduct, which has or could have a damaging effect on competition in the United Kingdom. And the idea of a fixed uh, price for farm produce could potentially fall foul if the prohibition identified in Part 1, Chapter 1, Section 2, uh, Paragraph A within the Act, which identifies the following as prohibited unless exempted. And I quote, directly or indirectly, uh, fixed purchases or selling prices or any other trading conditions. Now, I should say that there are the potential for pro, um, exemptions within the Competition Act, but I suppose the key, key questions as we sit here today is, would this prohibition apply to this potential bill? And secondly, could potential exemptions under the Act be secured? And I think, to be honest, you're best placed in that regard to, to actually seek professional legal advice on that basis if this proceeds. The second general issue I want to raise just is the lack of costings data. Um, the proposed bill drafts or, or draft bill proposes the creation and maintenance of both a fair farm gate prices index um, and a range of bodies that are linked to that and components that are linked to that. And those would undoubtedly accrue costs. I've set out the ones that I could identify on page 23. The bill like, explicitly references DARA as being responsible for paying appro appropriate remuneration and expenses to members of the panel and independent experts, as well as providing appropriate secretariat and other facilities. However, none of those provisions have been costed based on the information included within and accompanying the proposed draft bill. In addition, the proposed draft bill appears to suggest that DARA will bear all of these costs, as there's no reference to any other body or source of funding, and I would use, for example, the idea of a producer levy. No reference. Additionally, and as referenced in Section 5.1 of the paper, some of the outwork in the proposed draft bill could potentially lead to legal process. But the proposed draft bill does not explicitly state whether DARA would be liable for meeting the cost of such action, although by inference it could appear to have. Similarly, there is no indication as to whether funds generated by the proposed draft bill in the forms of fines could be utilised by DARA for the operation of the index and its supporting elements. And finally, uh, there seems to be no assessment of the potential costs emerging from the proposed draft bill for retailers and consumers. If such work has been completed by the, proposed, uh, by the bill proposers, it would be interesting to see if it actively considered, for example, the potential impacts on low-income households. Turning then to, to state aid considerations, um, as you will be aware, members, Article 10 within the, the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol sets out the provisions relating to state aid and is further supplemented by Annex 5 and Annex 6, 
with regard to the actual issue of agricultural support. In broad terms, agricultural support is exempt from the application of EU state aid rules in Northern Ireland, but the level uh, in terms of maximum ceiling of support for agricultural production and trade will be subject to approval by the Joint Committee. And indeed, in uh, last year, the 17th of December 2020, the Joint Committee published their decision on agricultural subsidies. In summary, the decision means that annual agricultural subsidies within Northern Ireland, up to the value of £382,200,000, are not subject to EU state rules or state aid rules. There is a bit of scope to go beyond that, but I'm not going to dwell on that here as well, up to the tune of about £25 million. The reason this issue is significant, I suppose, is relates to the point I made previously, that the, the draft bill proposals aren't costed. Uh, I suppose it equally has to be said that those bill proposals could be classified as state aid. And I suppose where this is significant, it means that the costs associated with the bill could theoretically input, impact on the amount of agricultural subsidy free from EU state aid constraints that DARA has to spend within an, a year. It's hard to make an accurate assessment of the potential risk here because we don't have uh, detailed costings. And I make these comments within the context of the government, UK government having committed £315 million of spending specifically for agriculture in Northern Ireland in 2021-22. Um, very briefly, uh, Treasury spending rules, there's also some potential implications here. Basically, the, the Treasury produces a series of principles for the allocation of funding across the UK. And principle 10, when it's there in front of you in black and white, but in broad terms, one of the risks here is if we have to, as a devolved administration go ahead and do something which has impacts across the rest of the UK, we would have to pay for it. Um, and I think that really leads us to the question, are there implications from the introduction of proposals as set out in this bill? Would those have cost implications for departments or agencies in the rest of the UK? Turning then very briefly to the, the Northern Ireland Act, the 1998 Northern Ireland Act, Article 26.4 within Part 2 of the Northern Ireland Act, um, as it relates to in international obligations, makes it clear, and I'm quoting here under Paragraph B, that um, if any so, uh, subordinate legislation made, confirmed or approved by a Minister of Northern Ar or Northern Ireland Department contains provision which the Secretary of State considers would have an adverse effect on the operation of the single market in goods and services within the UK, the Secretary of State may by order revoke the legislation. And I think on the basis of that, there is a need to establish if this would potentially have an adverse impact on the operation of the single market in goods and services. I'm nearly through these general ones, but please uh, bear with me. I'm trying to, to cover quite a bit of ground here, I realise. Implications for new agricultural policy and associated support. Um, at the time of writing, we still don't know um, the detail on the overall agricultural policy that will take us forward beyond 2021. But leaving budgetary issues aside, uh, I think it remains unclear if the proposed draft farm welfare bill is designed to supplement or replace provisions such as a potential area-based resilience payment. And I think that's a key question for the proposers and indeed uh, in relation to the department. In terms of what has informed the development of the proposed draft bill, as you will know, members, ordinarily an executive or a private member's bill that comes before the assembly has been subject to public consultation and stakeholder engagement. I have to say, when I looked at this in the documentation that came with the bill, there doesn't appear to be anything to, uh, to determine what level of consultation or engagement occurred with stakeholders. I think it would be useful to determine that and to, to learn the, the steps that led to the, the actual proposed draft bill in the form that it is at present. Um, that probably for now I, I'm going to leave as, as general issues. There are another two in there, but you, you're, you can look at those under your own fire because I'm conscious of time. And I want to turn then very quickly to specific issues within the, the, the bill. The first one I want to draw your attention to is this idea of defining and implementing best quality and lowest quality in terms of produce. Section 1, subsection 3 of the proposed draft bill makes reference to specifying a lowest price to be paid for best quality produce and a lowest price for produce of the lowest quality. How best quality is to be determined and who will have responsibility for this determination is not explicitly set out in the proposed draft bill. Subsection 3 within section 4 of the proposed draft bill indicates that DARA would have responsibility to appoint inspectors to consider disputes about the application of the index to transactions. 
and makes specific reference to the same inspectors playing a role in disputes about the quality of particular produce. There really is clarity needed here as the potential implications for DERA arising from playing a role in either the definition of quality or the consideration of disputes around the same could be significant in terms of resources. And I say that within the context of how extensive the range of agricultural products we are and the grades within it. It would seem inevitable that um, dispute resolution or definition of produce quality could potentially lead to legal action on the part of some producers, particularly if there was a significant difference in the minimum price paid for high quality and lowest quality produce. The cost of DERA through operating a dispute resolution system could be considerable even before the concept or idea of, of legal action was considered. And whilst the proposed bill makes no reference to it, in addition to the need for DARA inspectors to be involved in dispute resolution around quality, there would seem to be a logic for a wider inspection rule to ensure that quality standards are maintained to a standard to justify minimum pricing. This could potentially once again bring associated costs for DARA, unless this activity could be incorporated into existing on-farm inspection activity. I want to move then to the means um, of setting a cost of production uh, stroke minimum price. Section 5 of Section 1 within the proposed draft bill sets out the process by which the Fair Farm Gate Prices Index will determine both the cost of production and application of an additional pro appropriate margin to secure the long-term viability of farming businesses in Northern Ireland. Things in that, when I look at that, I think would be require clarification. Firstly, subsection 5A makes reference to using the most efficient 10% of farming businesses in Northern Ireland as a benchmark. But whilst mention is made of having regard to any subsidies and grants, there's no explanation as to whether this means that subsidies and grants are to be accounted for or discounted in the efficiency assessment. Secondly, uh, subsection 5b makes reference to specifying prices which represent the mean cost of production. Again, it would be useful to clarify if this means cost of production is derived from the aforementioned most efficient 10% of farm businesses or whether it represents the mean production costs of production for all farm businesses. Finally, subsection 5b also refers to securing the long-term viability of farm businesses by specifying prices that represent the cost of production plus the smallest margin referred to as the viability margin. It would be useful to explore with the proposed draft bill proposers what they believe would represent a fair viability margin. In addition, it would be helpful to establish once again whether viability margin would be added to the average production cost of all farms in Northern Ireland or the 10% most efficient. This is a potentially crucial question, as basing the cost of production on the most efficient farm businesses could potentially incentivise all farm businesses to become more efficient, whilst conversely using an average cost of production for all farm businesses could actually have the opposite effect and embed in efficiency. I also included a, a range of questions there in relation to the, uh, the fair farm gate pricing panel. I'm not going to look at those again on the basis of time. I'm going to look instead at the issue of defining seasonal produce. <coughs> and this is a key responsibility of the farm gate pricing panel, as set out in section 2, subsection 6c of the proposed draft bill. And that's the publication of a table showing the seasons with which each category of produce commonly sold by farming businesses is available for purchase in Northern Ireland. Whilst this work is to be informed by the independent experts appointed to the panel, there are no nonetheless a number of questions. Is seasonality uh, likely to apply to some produce more than others? What are the potential implications created by the adoption of extensive and wide-ranging seasonal definitions? Subsection 5 within Section 4 of the proposed bill suggests that it shall be a defence for a person charged with an offence under Subsection 4.1 to show that produce purchased was out of season at the time of purchase. This is a potentially significant point as it seems to confirm that, there, that it is an offence to purchase produce in season for retail sale in Northern Ireland from anyone other than a farming business in Northern Ireland. In light of this, there could be implications from the creation of a long or year-wide season for a product, as it could effectively mean that there could, these could only be bought from a local farm business. This could present issues in relation to UK competition law and operation of the UK single market, as it would have effectively create a monopoly on supply. Conversely, if seasonal periods were, were short or too short, there could be a legal means for retailers to get around the provisions in the proposed draft bill by mainly selling items in local stores which were out of season. This would enable retailers to source the product from either outside Northern Ireland or at a lower price within Northern Ireland, so long as they completed a valid produce non-availability report. 
<coughs> I just then finally want to look at um, offences within the proposed bill and associated penalties. The proposed draft bill appears to include two explicit offences as follows. Firstly, a relevant person buying listed produce from a farming business for a purchase price below the listed price. And secondly, a relevant person purchasing produce intended for retail sale within Northern Ireland from a supplier who is not a farming business. A person committing either of those offences is liable on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding 50000 I mentioned the uh, previous potential offence as well. Um, it does appear to be an offence to purchase produce in season for retail sale in Northern Ireland from anyone other than a farming business. It would be useful, I think, to confirm with the actual bill proposers if that is an intended or a non-intended offence. With regards to fine levels, um, I think it has to be said that um, it would be useful to know how the bill proposers reach the decision to utilise a fine up to £50,000 upon summary conviction. As members will know, and on the, the general uh, level of fine, the level 5 fine that we would generally use in the standard scale, equates to £5,000 under the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Order, 1994. It is theoretically possible for a fine to exceed that £5,000 maximum, uh, but it would need to be defined why this would need to be the case. There are examples, for example, under the Planning Act, the uh, 2011, which includes offences relating to contravention of hazardous substances control, where a person can actually be liable um, on summary conviction to a fine up to £100,000. In relation to offences too, it would be useful to know if the bill proposers have considered additional options relating to offences such as inclusion of conviction and indictment, differentiating, differentiating between individuals and companies, including provisions for second and further convictions, and including provisions for a custodial sentence in addition to or instead of fine on summary conviction. Members, that is a very quick run through. I appreciate there's all their information in there. But I am more than happy to try and answer questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that very thorough and informative piece of, of research. Uh, can I just uh, remind members if they have any questions or points of clarification, just to put it onto the group chat, uh, and I'll call you in order. M Mark, can I ask, uh, just in terms of the implications of the bill potentially on all island trade. I mean, obviously, agriculture there's you no know, moves north and south uh, without much restriction. I mean, if, if this bill uh, was introduced in the north, I mean, is there potential impacts on the all island trade or all island agriculture? I think it's a, it's a good question, Philip. It's not one I suppose we're in a position to answer because we don't know what the impact impact would be on price. I think the major issue would have either north-south or east-west movement out of Northern Ireland. And that's, I suppose, the important thing to remember is that we are, uh, we produce food and sell food across different markets. Where, and I'm not, I'm reluctant to use export, but we have most of our sales outside of Northern Ireland. So anything which would effectively make our product more expensive than within those markets, particularly if those were markets that we were selling to for processing or retailing, I think we have to be honest and say that could have a potential impact upon the ability of our product to compete in those markets. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, William, you're up first. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, Mark, um, I don't know this is probably fraught with difficulties. In relation to uh, fair farm gate prices, uh, is there a proposal that the government makes up the difference in the price, is that, you know, if the if price falls, is the, the, this bill mean that the government has to make up the difference, is that what their proposal is? No, the, my reading of it, William, is that effectively the, the burden lies with the individuals who have to buy the product. So the product it fixes the price. There, there doesn't appear to be, as I read it, any outline of a government intervention to keep the price or to, to effectively supplement or make up the difference. The issue effectively is that DERA, through the, the panel and the index uh, and the independent experts, is, is effectively involved in setting the price. But there's no indication of additional support to make up a difference. Well, I mean, does it therefore not mean that if every price is set too high, and if this were to ever go ahead, 
uh, does it not mean that we would price ourselves out of some markets? I think it, it, that, that would be one of the fears I would have, and I mentioned that to, to Philip in relation to the, the previous answer. And I suppose it, it does come, and I, look, I appreciate a lot of the detail of this, if it came forward, would need to be worked out. But I suppose the, the actual task initially of working out a, a price for the myriad range of products we have would be extensive. And I also made the point in the presentation around determining what the actual uh, margin that you would add to that. You know, the fiction of that could be, that could make a major difference upon how attractive your product could be. Um, and I suppose, even at a very basic level, if we were only fixing the prices for products in Northern Ireland, made a differentiation to products, for example, we sold into GB, I imagine that might raise questions among um, retailers and indeed consumers as to why something that was produced next door to them cost more here than it did across the water or down south. Um, so you, you could, in theory, be at risk of effectively cutting your, your nose off in relation to your ability to access market. I think that's a real risk. Uh, I have no concern, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, William Patsy. I'm on air there now. Um, yeah, thanks very much indeed for that, Mark. That, that was a very, very, very comprehensive and adept uh, series of questions that you did raise for some good research there. Uh, just, just one thing I uh, wanted to tell you, and obviously a lot of these questions will be for the proposers of the bill and the, their background to it, and I'm sure they, they'll have thought through the, the answers to these. Um, one thing, and, and I'm sort of, ways, if you like, questioning, Two different approaches here. One is the the obvious uh, effects of the, the protocol is that we have access to mainland European markets for our food produce. Could you maybe just explore to me there? I saw you were uh, touching upon the implications of that in terms of competition regulation um, by way of compliance with EU uh, regulations and, and laws. Um, the second thing, and then maybe flipping it back to the more uh, contemporary in that um, we've seen more recently that the uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson and, and the British government have been opening up uh, conversations around uh, a trade deal with Australia, a trade deal with Australia around food produce, which could severely undermine certainly um, those farmers and producers in England, uh, Scotland and Wales. We may have some residual protection from that via the, the protocol. So, could you just explore with me in the event of a trade deal uh, with uh, Australia, which would allow for importation of tariff free or zero zero tariff imports um, to GB? Could you could you maybe just uh, give us some of your thinking around that, or you, you may well have to go back and do some further research on the implications of it, which I'm happy enough for. But if you have any initial thoughts about that, please, Mark. Thank you, Patsy. And I, and I suppose I'm reluctant to say without seeing the detail um, of those trade deals, uh, because <laughs> as, as you would be aware, I suppose any free trade deal will have exemptions or restrictions. Um, it, you know, there, it's rare for a, a trade deal to simply have a, a free-for-all. Look, I think, I think the risks you identify are real. Um, uh, anybody who's been following any of the, the farming press over the last few weeks is it's well aware that the NFU, for example, uh, in GB is very alarmed about the potential impact of the importation uh, of lower cost food from whatever market. But without actually seeing the detail of the, the trade deal, That's it's kind of hard to assess the full risks. But we I mean, get that. We probably um, come back to that if we could, please, Jess. Yes, yes I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, if, if you want to discuss that, I mean, that's something we could look at definitely. Um, but I mean, I think Good. that, I suppose, the, the table I included early on, Patsy, some of those other countries w which employ mechanisms which are effectively around price interventions, some of that is to deal with those issues. Um, so, I mean, I suppose that's why I said there were precedents. Um, but I suppose it's how you actually do that and, and how achievable and how sustainable any system you come up with is. And whilst recognising that I suppose any of those systems are almost swimming against the tide in terms of, of agricultural policy across the world. Okay. Mr. Well, thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. Rosemary. Thank you, and thank you, Mark, for that um, for that document. That's very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, Mark, a couple of questions. 
Again, one of them was, Patsy sort of touched on it with regard to EU regulations and food, or food coming in from other countries. How would you see, for example, food affected, food that's coming in to, even coming in from, the, from GB into Northern Ireland and the food that could be produced through this farm gate method, surely there'll be a problem there in relation to fair prices, etc. Yeah, I think, um, Rosemary, without again having the detail of what this would look like, um, I think it's fair to unfair that there would potentially be impacts on... I mean, retailers will look to try and maximise their profit. Um, and as, as you know, I touched upon the issues around seasonality. Well, that, you know, if, if you create a monopoly, does the product then be stocked in the stores if the retailer doesn't want to pay it? There's lots of questions there that um, I suppose I don't have the answers for because I don't have the detail, but... I think they're pertinent ones because with the, I think the idea of protecting farmers and their income is, is a very uh, valid one. Um, you don't want to do something which could conversely um, actually reduce their income by reducing their ability to sell their produce. Um, and I think that's, as we move forward, whether it's free trade deals, whether it's trade in the GB, whether it's trade into the EU, we probably want to be trying to do something that, that maximises the opportunity for farmers to sell in multiple markets. Yeah. Okay. Thank you on that one. And then it's to go back to we we talked you talked about the most efficient ten percent of farm business farming businesses in subsection five b. Mm -hmm. Who decides who are or what farm businesses are the most efficient? How is that process well, carried out? At this point, Rosemary. Um, carried out. Dara actually, actually calculates and has that data. Um, they have okay. uh, costings data. I mean, if, if you want, I, I'm happy to provide that uh, to you. But it's in the, their annually published report. I can't remember which of the, the annual publications it is, but I can send that to you. Uh, and it does by sector uh, in terms of what the top 10% uh, most efficient are or what the bottom t uh, 10 or 25. I can't remember. But they effectively have costed out. And you can see there's quite considerable variation and how efficient uh, uh, some of these businesses are and some that aren't. Yeah, uh -huh. and the last, last question I want to ask, again, it's on the seasonal, it's on seasonal food and um, actually the fines, et cetera. Can, can you explain a wee bit more? If, um, if uh, businesses within Northern Ireland don't buy these, by this seasonal food that's produced in Northern Ireland, we're talking about fines. Is that what you speak of? Well, I, I, I don't think I can unfair that, Rosemary. What I'm, I'm saying is if you stocked a product which was in season, I mean, that's why I said almost the, the, the get around might be for some retailers simply not to choose to stock an item. Okay, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think if, if you stocked an item which was in season and you hadn't purchased from a farmer in Northern Ireland, that's the question that I ask. Um, I think yeah. that's the, the issue. Um, but Absolutely. as I said, the retailer may simply go, they want to stock it, um, yeah. which again would, would leave the actual farmer worse off. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. Hi. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mark. Mark, I'm just wondering, will the climate change bill not drastically affect this bill, firstly? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I suppose it, undoubtedly, Harry, I think it will impact um, across agriculture. In, ter in terms of the specific paper, that wasn't something I considered. Um, but look, I think anything which affects the costs that farms have to bear, um, whether that's in terms of the adoption of mitigation measures, th that will undoubtedly reflect upon the type of price they will have to get for their product. Now, conversely, um, you could equally argue if the number of farms dropped or the number of, of uh, the level of produce dropped, the price for that, in theory, could go up because it's a supply and demand. But in terms of the actual detail around that, it's kind of hard to, to unpick because we're dealing with a conceptual bill here and we're dealing with proposals for a, a climate bill that we don't know the full impact in terms of agriculture at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of good points here. I mean, even like going back, the fact that uh, co-op producers want farmers produce more, get more, all the rest of it didn't really work out. They're working twenty four seven. It hasn't really been fair overall. Sure, it hasn't been. 
I think I think there are different opinions. I think the the key question probably to a lot of this, and it, it is, as I said, it's a, it's a meritorious, um, really, I suppose, aim of this bill. Um, as I say, there may be questions around how it would be delivered. Is to try and deliver farming which is sustainable in terms of income. Now, sustainable, you can look out through different lenses. I suppose this is focused on on income, um, but I think that um, has been a challenge in my time in the assembly. Uh, and I'm here now 11 years in June, and no doubt will would continue to be for decades going forward. So, um, I think the the volatility that farmers have experienced, particularly over the last five years, has raised questions around what, how could you make a, a viable income from this business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, John. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mark, for, for all of the information presented. Um, we've covered a number of, of matters already, but I'm, I'm keen to know, and I'll apologise if I haven't picked it up properly in the report, um, given that, that farm gate issues have been uh, around and, and pretty public for some time, is there any sign of, uh, through, in the research, was there any sign of similar legislation as outlined in this proposed bill, or attempts to bring forward um, <clears throat> such legislation in, in any other regions of uh, the UK or Ireland? Yeah, John, and, and I, I, there is some reference in the paper, for example, to the UK Agriculture Act 2020. Um, there are provisions there, and indeed this was looked upon at a, a European level a number of years ago too, to focus on the whole actual concept of uh, fairness in the food supply chain. Yeah. So that you felt we could deal at a level to ensure the contracts were fair and the people were getting an actual fair price for a fair product. So there have been uh, measures that have been explored really over the last five to six years, in my knowledge. Yeah. The very specific one, and I did reference it, I didn't actually cover it, but I mean, I'll quite happily draw your attention to it there, was the, the whole concept around um, the Farm Welfare Bill, uh, the UK one, uh, or sorry, the UK Agriculture Act. Section 29 of the UK Agriculture Act, uh, which does extend and apply to Northern Ireland, gives the DEFRA Minister, not our local minister, the DEFRA Minister, powers to make regulations to introduce obligations that promote fair contractual relationships between primary producers, producer organisations, associations of producer organisations, produce aggregators and the business purchasers of their products. Now, in November of last year, DEFRA actually published the outline plan for the path to sustainable farming. And that covered the period up to 2024. And the interesting thing there was that, that that actual document includes the following intention. I'm quoting here. Use powers in the Agriculture Act 2020 to address market failures that have led to farmers having a weaker position in the supply chain. We've consulted on mandatory dairy contracts and will act to ensure that trading practices are fair for farmers in all sectors. So there, there is indication that that provision is being explored in GB. I had asked the question in the paper, is there any prospect of those powers being uh, again applied in Northern Ireland and to what sectors and to what products? I suppose it's, it's a case at the minute of waiting and see what this means. Okay, although it looks to me, uh, Mark, that that, that, that that as outlined wouldn't go as far or uh, isn't as detailed as what's being proposed here. Is that a fair comment? I think I think that's a fair a fair comment, John. Um, I think I suppose that's what I'm talking about here in relation to and what Defra was talking about is more um, I suppose ensuring the contracts are fair rather than getting into the detail of what product gets what price. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Claire. Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks very much for that. That's a huge um, report on the bill. Um, but with regards to the OECD, um, and the OECD recommend that governments should target any market failures that lead to persistent low incomes within the agri sector, uh, and it's maybe linking into that uh, the. DEFRA ministers moves with the Agri Bill that you're talking about there as well. But do you have any more details um, or did you find any through the report on that OECD recommendation at all? I suppose the, the, the data is presented is very much a summary. There's detailed information on, in, in relation to all the OECD member countries. Um, 
Look, as I said uh, previously, I think this challenge of sustainable farming across the board is, is one that is it's being experienced in nearly all of those countries. Um, and I suppose the, the concept of trying to ensure that people who produce our food um, have a sustainable or a viable long-term future is, is something that public um, policy is grappling with across the world. Um, I mean, I can, I can definitely bring you, uh, that to your attention or look at any of those examples. It's a massive report that's produced annually, but all of that data is in there. And see, when we're looking at the UK competition law, would welfare concerns be grounds for exemption? For example, we know that like 25% of farming families here are living in poverty. Would that be something that could be considered under exemptions? Well, that, I suppose, Claire, I'm not, I'm not uh, from a legal professional background, so I'm, 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 I'm going to duck that one. I think you would, you would you re fact, you require professional legal advice to determine that. Okay, and then that, that was uh, the other thing that I was thinking as well. Sort of, you know, if current government policies um, incentivise um, incentivise you know, maybe if they're focusing on um, intensive production models, or for example, those policies are leading to environmental harms. I was wondering, would that be grounds to intervene? But is that the same? In terms of legal advice needed there more than I think you would and I, suppose, and I also would I suppose and I was cautious in the paper to declare that we don't have sight of the future agricultural uh, policy proposals in detail at this point that are being forthcoming from DARA and, and undoubtedly uh, that's one of the questions I raised as to how the proposals in this bill would sit alongside those would they complement them or would they actually run contrary to them okay thank you Morris Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks very much, Mark, for your uh, your research as usual. So to talk, talk, Mark. Uh, can I ask you some maybe uh, a wee question, Mark? Uh, my my reading of this this bill uh, and its purpose is to reflect a more equitable equitable price between costs of production uh, uh, be the low level of purchase from retailers. In your opinion, Mark, can can the, the proposed farm welfare bill? Have the desired effect to uh, compel large corporates to reduce their profit margin and not pass on any increases to the consumer. Is that can, is that clear anywhere within the bill? In your your opinion, I think, Morris, that, that it's actually a concern I flagged in relation to what impact minimum pricing would have. Uh, and the, the proposers may well have done an assessment of that. Um, it's not something that, that I saw in the uh, accompanying documentation. But I did draw attention to the fact what impact um, would increased prices have on low-income families, for example. That's, that isn't clear. Um, we know the, how retailers, I suppose, historically have operated, uh, and indeed farmers have direct experience where the, product they, the price they receive for their product is not reflected in the price that is, is charged at the supermarket. So, you know, somebody will have to pay for the difference. Or alternatively, as I said, one of the risks is that somebody, the retailer might say, your price is too high, we'll source this from somewhere else, or we won't stock it because it's in season. So it, it raises questions this around um, how workable the proposal is in that regard. Um, I think it, it merits further discussion, but I would, would have those concerns. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Mark. I have those concerns myself that it'll be ultimately the, uh, the consumer that bears the cost. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Morris, uh, th that's all the questions. So once again, just on behalf of all of us, Mark, I want to thank you for the, the thorough document. No doubt it will be a useful tool for all of us uh, to use uh, as we go through this process. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, okay, we're just going to move on then to uh, item six on the CLAR, uh, oral evidence from DERA on proposals for a farm welfare bill. Can I just refer members uh, to papers from the department at page 35? And I welcome Dina uh, Seamus McGurlian, uh, Dira Chief Economist, and Mark McLean, Principal Agricultural Economist. So, uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen, and can I just ask you if you just want to uh, brief, brief the committee? Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I suppose our focus is going to be more on the economic logic of the bill as opposed to. Um, that going through it in the forensic way that uh, the assembly researcher did. 
So I'll just start by saying that uh, I understand what the authors of this potential bill are trying to achieve. They're trying to ensure that Northern Ireland farmers get a price that covers the cost of production and gives farmers a margin. So effectively, they're trying to guarantee better incomes. Um, but in our view, the approach proposed uh, has some very major flaws which fundamentally undermine it. If this bill did manage to set prices, um, we have to remember that income is a product of prices and the quantity sold. Um, if prices set under the bill are higher than prices normally paid in our external markets, then this makes Northern Ireland farm produce less competitive in those external markets. So around 70% of food processed in Northern Ireland is sold outside Northern Ireland. So that's quite an important consideration. If Northern Ireland offers its product for sale in these external markets at a higher price than our competitors, then we can expect the quantity sold to fall as these buyers opt for cheaper prices uh, that are available from competitors. So if the quantity sold goes down, then so does Northern Ireland agricultural income. So in this respect, the bill is counterproductive um, in terms of trying to achieve better incomes. Another flaw of the bill is that Northern Ireland suppliers of feed, fertilizer and other inputs could put up their prices safe in the knowledge that government would recalculate the cost of production in Northern Ireland and raise minimum prices accordingly, meaning that ex the external competitiveness of Northern Ireland farm produce would be continually undermined. It is unclear if the bill uh, would be compatible with UK law or indeed EU regulation that is applied under the protocol. Competition is a reserved matter in the UK, so the Assembly has no remit in that area. The relevant UK legislation is um, the UK Internal Market Bill, or sorry, Act of 2020, and the Competition Act uh, 1998. A further issue with this bill is that it would, through its anti-avoidance provisions, effectively stop certain food products coming into Northern Ireland. So product from GB, GB farms would be prohibited from coming into Northern Ireland. Likewise, produce from ROI farms or farms further afield in Europe or the rest of the world so this would create a new barrier to trade, um, especially within these islands. You would have barriers to trade from east to west and from south to north. Around half the food processed in Northern Ireland is sold in GB. And it's not difficult to guess how significant numbers of consumers in GB might react to finding out that GB farmers could not sell their product in Northern Ireland, but Northern Ireland expected to sell around half of its farm produce to GB consumers. So in conclusion, I think the approach set out in this bill is flawed and could actually see a contraction of agriculture in Northern Ireland which I think would be the opposite of what the authors are trying to achieve. So um, there's other issues with the bill, but I think I'll, I'll stop there for now. And uh, Mark and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Chair. Oh, okay, Seamus, thank, thank you very much. Can I just remind members uh, again, <clears throat> if they want to ask questions or make any points, just to indicate via the, the, the group chat. Patsy, you're up first. Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you uh, 
Jameson, and good to see you, uh, you and Mark again. Um, th there's one thing now, I uh, put the question previously to the, to the other Mark, and that was um, about the potentials of uh, what I would see as risky trade deals. And you've probably read all the press notification, you've read the stuff about the, the NFU's deep concerns about um, tariff-free trade deals uh, with the likes of Australia and the importation of cheap produce. And if, obviously, if, if a, a tariff-free or whatever uh, type of trade deals negotiated with, with Australia, there will be other countries in the rest of the world, Brazil and places like that, be saying, hey, we need a piece of that action. Now, the aims of this welfare farm bill are very laudable and that this is to make sure that people are paid a right wage and a proper uh, income for the produce that they are making now. And we know and Claire referred earlier there to farm families, many of those are, are on the bread line already. So my question is, how do we prevent a race to the bottom? Because with these, uh, what it seems to be, trade deals with, with other parts of, of the world, that's exactly what is going to be the consequential of it. And that's obviously what the NFU uh, concerns are about. And if you're saying, Seamus, you referred there, and I was going to ask you the question anyway, but 70% uh, of the, the food produce from the north here is sold outside in, in other jurisdictions, and 50% of that's going to GB. This is the query. If the GB market is flooded with cheap importations, some of which, and well, we're, we're moving on to climate change stuff and all of that, there's consequentials for, for, for the climate about transportation, like, but some of which is, is really cheap. How do we prevent that race to the bottom? What sort of interventions can be made and, and in what way? Because this is an attempt to try and do that, I'm hearing what the consequentials and the impact of that may be, but really, I think this bill, you're saying it would be a threat to, to farm gate prices and to incomes and the likes. I think there are other potential threats which are much, much larger and uh, which uh, the, the British government, the Westminster government, seems intent on going headlong to. Sorry, can't hear you, Seamus, you're switched off there. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yep. Uh, sorry about that. Um, it's a complicated question. Uh, um, obviously, trade uh, is another reserve matter, which um, we don't have a, a direct say in. Um, we get to feed our views in, and we obviously do that at every opportunity. Um, uh, and a, a, a tariff-free trade deal with Australia obviously is a threat because Australia is a big producer of uh, beef and sheep and could sell quite a lot into the UK market and that would be obviously detrimental to us because you know um, there would be a competitor in the GB market for sure um, their prices um, are lower than ours. Um, the normal approach to protecting the market for uh, local producers is to use tariffs and to treat certain um, sectors as sensitive and to uh, use tariffs. So that's the normal approach for dealing with that particular issue. I don't think this bill is a solution because if our produce is more expensive um, then it has even less chance of competing with Australian produce uh, in the GB market. I'm not sure if Mark wants to add anything to that. Yeah, like the only thing I would add is, in, you know, like in terms of the bill working, as Seamus has said, if, if we increase prices, there's two things going to happen. Is one, we're going to be less competitive with our exports, but secondly, Imports are going to come in from Northern Ireland at a lower price, and therefore our own produce won't be, you know, won't be bought, because retailers aren't going to buy more expensive produce if they, if they have the option of of cheaper produce. So, in order to try and make that work, then you'd have to start putting on import controls 
you know, on, on food, which is hinted at in the circumvention measures from food from the EU, from the rest of the world and from GB. And, um, you know, that's just not feasible for, for Northern Ireland to do that. And it's, it's not legal either. Um, so, you know, that's where the, that's where the difficulties are. This is this is the nub of it all because this has all been stimulated by it over oh, over generations and farm produce and Mark, you're from that type of background. You you know well what I'm talking about. The how do you stop this race to the bottom? If tariffs and what other sort of interventions are available? Because for the food producer who is putting the food out there, the multinationals are coming in and looking. They're they're cut of it that person has been driven down and driven down and driven down and often they don't have a strong voice to the only voice or the only measure or only way that that can be protected is by some sort of government intervention. So how, in light of the bigger context, how do we stop that race to the bottom? Who continues to make representation to the UK government on trade deals and certainly our view would be is the most adequate measure of protection is, is through tariff protection. And, you know, we, we all recognise that in trade deals, there has to be some give and take. And the way in which it's usually done for agricultural produce is if there's to be any extra market access, it's done through tariff rate quotas, whereby you can control the amount of imports uh, coming in. And, you know, you, you offer a small amount of, of additional market access and certainly the reports of zero tariffs, zero quotas on free trade deals with the likes of Australia would be would be very concerning. But as Seamus has said, trade trade deals is a reserved area, but we will certainly and indeed, you know, other devolved administrations will be doing the same is, is making the strongest representations to the UK government on, on, on the matter. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Mark and Seamus. Very much good, Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, John. Thanks, Chair. Um, Seamus, Mark, thank you both, by the way, for, for the information you brought to us. Um, we heard there just, just before you, your presentation from our own researchers that there's been some mention by DEFRA of taking action around using powers in the Agriculture Act 2020 to address the issue of failures uh, the farmers have faced and that have put them in a, what is termed, I think, in, in by them as a, a weaker position. Are you aware of progress on that that could uh, affect Northern Ireland or similarly any separate measures that could, that could impact here in the same way that this bill intends to or parts of this bill intends to? You're on mute, Seamus. Hey, unfortunately, I don't think I am. You're okay, we can hear you. Can, I see? can you hear me? Yep. Yep. I, I, I'm honestly not pushing the mute button. <laughs> maybe I'm being muted somewhere else. Or maybe I'm just not pointing in the right direction, but you can hear me now. Um, yeah, I, th I think there is work ongoing on, on contracts um, which would offer farmers better protection. Um, obviously, when prices fall, if you, if you have a contract, then that contract has to be honoured and, and, and hopefully that gives you a better price than you might otherwise have got without it. So I think there is work ongoing to, to sort of formalise that and, and put a bit of structure around it. So I think it is a, an approach that can work for farmers, yes. Well, we're not sure of detail on that yet or what the implications for Northern Ireland would be, I take it? We're not, um, well, it's not my area of responsibility, so there may well be some work going on within the department on it, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately not able to report what it may or may not be. Okay. Thank you. We, we can we can see some uh, any progress there and try and get some details. So thanks, Seamus, for that. Yeah, but if I could just if I could just add, like this is on for contracts. You know, it's you know there there isn't any work going on about you know the the UK government intervening to set prices higher than what the market price would be. 
Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, Rosemary. Um, a couple of things. Um, how would how would uh, for these uh, for this uh, fair farm gate pricing? How would that work out in relation to multinationals buying globally? Is there any thoughts given to that? If you're a multinational uh, and you're buying from Northern Ireland farmers and you're also buying from farmers uh, elsewhere and you're thinking about expanding your operation and, and you know that it's going to be more expensive to buy from farmers in Northern Ireland, well, I think that's going to feed into your your decision making. So I think there is an issue there. Right. Okay. Um, and... And another thing um, you said in your you said in your documentation, as such Northern Ireland Assembly and Deer have no remit to introduce minimum price legislation on farm gate prices. Now they are not going to introduce this minimum price legislation if this bill was to be enacted if this was to become enacted, this what we're looking at, obviously that's going to have to change. Um, I think what I said was we have no remit in this area um, as such. Um, and again, <laughs> I'm not able to give you legal advice on this, and I think it's probably something that needs to be sought in respect of it. But I would have thought if this was passed, it would be subject to challenge uh, under all the existing legislation. Um, Mark, is there anything you want to add on that one? Yeah, just also just want to emphasise the consequences of it. Like clearly, there's going to have to be restrictions on imports into Northern Ireland to, to enable this to, to work in, in 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 any sense of the of the word. Obviously, we've outlined the consequences that would be for Northern Ireland exports. But you know, there's no point raising prices in Northern Ireland if imports are just going to come in and substitute them. Uh, that just would be damaging. So there would have to be restrictions on imports from the from the EU and indeed from GB. And I think both of those are, are extremely problematic. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Surely there would be issues there if you're going to restrict those. Yeah. Like the, the, the agreement reached between the, the UK and the EU doesn't allow restrictions on EU imports into Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Rosemary. Claire? Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm looking, I think it was at UCD have estimated that if this bill was enacted, it could create up to ten to 20,000 good quality jobs in Northern Ireland just at the start, and then there would be more after that. Would you be of the same opinion? Have you done a jobs estimation on this one? Well... For the reasons we've already outlined, we think this bill would actually be counterproductive in terms of uh, growth within the agriculture sector. So I'm afraid we would have a different view on the number of jobs that it would create. Seamus, you said at the start there that um, you understand the aims of the authors of the bill, and it's obviously trying to get a fair price and make a margin. Um, and you're absolutely right to agree to but and, and one of the main purposes of the bill is really to force large corporate food retailers and corporate food wholesalers um, to give farming families their fair share of that financial cake, if you will. Um, are you, I mean, is this for sure, I mean, everything seems to be predicated to do that then would increase the cost to the consumer. Um, but I read it a wee bit differently as well. Surely this would not affect the, the retail price of food other than normal inflationary increases? Well, I think, you know, the, it's often pointed out that the farmers get and the final retail price, there's quite a, a margin of difference in there. And while there would be some scope possibly for retailers to absorb some of it, um, I think the way that a lot of large, re 
food retailers work is they work on very small margins themselves because they sell so much food that they're able to work on very small margins. So um, obviously different people have different views, but um, certainly I think you know, their view would be that, that some of that would be passed on to consumers. And say when we know that there's 25% of farming families in Northern Ireland living in poverty. I mean, that's quite a, a shocking statistic and it's a long-term statistic as well. Um, let, what are officials or the minister um, doing to input with DERA um, with the creation of this new agri-bill just to, to make sure that um, the UK Agri Bill really does allow our farmers a fair price and incomes that we can embed that sustainable element into future policies? Well, I think there's a lot of thinking ongoing currently with around um, what future agricultural support should look like. So, um, and I think all of these issues will be considered within that piece of work. But, um, you know, we're, we're not able to, I think it's, we're hoping to be able to come out with something in the next few months, I believe, and I'm not exactly sure either when they're coming out, but to be fair, there's a lot of thinking going on, and I think we just have to wait to see what comes out of that. And when you started, Seamus, you um, were saying that you believe that this bill will be counterproductive in trying to achieve better incomes, because 70% of our food is sold abroad. Have you any idea? So that's seventy five or seventy percent of our food being sold abroad. That's to um, foreign companies then, or to foreign countries. Is that well, right? Uh, it includes sales to GB. So fifty percent of what we uh, process in Northern Ireland is sold into GB. Twenty five percent is sold to other countries, roughly. So it leaves about twenty five or thirty. Uh, that, as far as our stats say, may, is likely to be consumed locally, although some of that may be bought by firms that subsequently sell it on to other countries. The stats are difficult. Which, all we can know is who it goes to first after being processed in Northern Ireland. We're not altogether, we don't follow it all the way to its final con, uh, consumer, but I think it's reasonably safe that. Uh, Seventy percent certainly goes to external markets. Okay, so when you say external markets, is there any indication for what type of percent? How much goes outside of the UK? It depends on uh, the sector. The sector we do. Uh, uh, I, I don't have them to hand. I don't think. Okay, and then have you any idea of the amount of the, those businesses from outside the UK that are accessing um, products here or trading with our farming families here, um, have you any idea how many of them would have access to the, the investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, for example? Or is that all lay with Westminster and DEFRA's ability to do the trade deals rather than us? Well, I think Department for Economy lead on, on, on issues like that, so it's probably a better question for their officials. Okay, and you wouldn't get that information flowing through to the department then? I'm not sure whether Mark has any more information on that one. No, I don't like the investor dispute mechanisms. You know, is it, it's not an area within the remit of the, of the department. It's not something we have discussions on with you know, with DEFRA, because it's, it's not within their remit either. It would be the Department for International Trade would, would, would deal with it. Okay, and the sort of rationale for asking that is, is looking at, you know, if we know that current practice is leading and sustaining um, our farming families to live in poverty, I'm wondering about, you know, what are those foreign trade deals if 70% of our produce is going to foreign markets as the department is classing it? You know, is the, the government or the department or the ministers or our own ability to get a fair price being blocked by the formation of these trade deals? Um, and I think that it's one I want to keep an eye on, given that we are making new trade deals post-Brexit as well. 
Yeah, well, I think it just maybe we want to clarify, like, you know, the 70% going outside of Northern Ireland, you know, there's a lot of that going to, to GB. Um, yeah, that, would be that wouldn't be a um, foreign market per se, that would no. be a domestic market. Yeah. And there yes. would be nothing there preventing ourselves from sustaining and maintaining fair pricing within our yeah, domestic but, market. You know, clearly, if you go to bring in a bill for fair pricing within Northern Ireland, um, you know, that's going to impact on the ability to sell goods outside Northern Ireland if it's a higher price than what's available in GB because retailers in GB will not buy it if they can, you know, if they can get food from elsewhere that's, that's cheaper. So, you know, that's where the, you know, that's where the context is is for this. Um, you know, we're not saying that 70% of of Northern Ireland goods is going to go into foreign markets. But clearly, if you bring in a bill that treats Northern Ireland, you know, differently in terms of a, of a minimum price, um, you know, that's that's very relevant then because that effectively becomes becomes an export uh, in relation to what the bill is trying to do. Uh, just to be last one, in France are trying to make moves at the minute. I think they're looking into this um, uh, farm gate pricing is that anything that you're having conversations with DEFRA about a plan in the UK, or is there any conversation going on with that? No, there's no discussions in terms of you know minimum farm gate pricing. Like the, you know, the, the EU has attempted to do this in the past, and it did, it did bring in import. Um, you know, it had import controls and still does have tariffs, and also it had export subsidies, which were very unpopular with developing countries because it meant that exports were going from the EU to developing countries subsidized and was lowering was lowering their market prices. You know, it also incentivized production within the EU and led to oversupply. And you know, that whole approach has been gradually abandoned and it has moved towards say uh, direct support and you know towards decoupled income support. You know, uh, and, that, and that's that's what we have at the moment. So you know, the agricultural sector is it is well supported. And um, there's 293 million of direct payments is is paid each year to it. Uh, at the moment, the farm. Sorry, that's public subsidies. That's right, but it did derive from. But they're needed because we're not getting a profitable or a fair price. Well, it, you know, it, it derived from historically where the EU had higher prices than the market price. It abandoned that approach, reduced those prices, and the direct support was compensation for the reduction in prices. So that's, that's where it derived from. Thanks very much. Cheers. Sorry, uh, uh, the chair was back, so I thought he was taking over, but he, he maybe he hasn't got hooked up yet. So, uh, William, you're next. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, I think as a former myself, uh, I've formed all my life, so I know a wee bit about the industry. But, I mean, I think we all are concerned with free, free trade deals. Um, but, of course... We had all the doom and gloomers in the past said when we left Europe and Brexit, land prices would just fall and it would be disastrous for sheep farmers. And that, the very opposite has happened. The land prices probably are the highest level they've ever been at. Uh, after we left Europe, uh, I have some, some concerns in regard to fixed pricing that we do as officials are saying. We do, how you do that without pricing yourself out of the market, I'm not so sure. I don't see a way around that. but. Um, is there anywhere else in Europe, in the UK or Europe, that has a fixed price and legislation in place? Anywhere that you're aware of? I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm not aware of anywhere in Europe. Mark, have you any information on that? No, there isn't anything in terms of you know minimum pricing as it's been construed in this you know, in this bill, like within the EU, um, 
you know, the, the common agricultural policy operates, and you know, previously it it uh, operated an intervention price system whereby you know it tried to keep prices at a minimum minimum level, and then whenever prices fell below it, produce could be sold into intervention, um, and that was operating at EU level. But as I was saying, the uh, EU has moved away from that uh, because it has, you know, it created a lot of problems. It didn't, it didn't resolve anything. And, you know, the intervention system is still there at a much reduced level. Clearly, as market prices are high at the moment, it's not being, you know, it's not being used. The, 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 the intervention prices are, you know, are at such a level that you know farmers wouldn't wouldn't regard them as a sustainable price. So it's it's only there as an an emergency safety net, and you know that has been carried and retained in in UK law for the time being, uh, as you know all the EU laws were were carried over in the process of of withdrawal. Um, but you know it's, it's clearly it's not relevant at the moment given the high market prices. Yeah, so, so what you are saying that it, it indicates of overproduction and there was an issue uh, the UK still has a will of availability of uh, but some of the private storage, yes. In the right. It is there, yes, uh, you know, if there was if there if there was very low prices. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um members can you pick me up okay, okay I'm back online here again? Yeah. Um, okay, as I have no other members down to speak, I'd like to take the opportunity uh, to thank you uh, very, very, very much for coming uh, here this morning, uh, Mark and Seamus. And uh, no doubt we'll be hearing more from you in the time ahead on this issue and on many other issues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Right, take care. Okay, members, um, we're going to move on now to item number seven. It's an oral evidence session from DERA on nature-friendly farming. Uh, I want to refer members to the papers at page 65 of your pack. And I want to, like, I want to welcome by Starleaf, Dave Foster, the Director of Regulatory and Natural Resources Policy, and Ro Rosemary uh, Agnew, Brexit Director. I'd like to ask the officials to brief the committee, and then members will uh, ask some questions thereafter. So, um, okay, very welcome, Dave and Rosemary. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think I'm going to lead off. Can you hear me okay, Chair and Committee? Yeah, I can, and I have other, other committee members okay too? I think so. I'll assume so. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, members. Um, thank you very much this morning for the opportunity to discuss nature-friendly farming. And I do, Dave and I both realise that it's something the committee has a significant interest in and has received a number of presentations and discussed at previous committee meetings. You've asked this morning that um, we would focus on two things, really, what DERA is doing to encourage nature-friendly farming good practice, and secondly, what is likely to, to be in any future agricultural policy to support nature-friendly farming. Um, Dave has joined me, as we say, as, as you've indicated, and he will cover what DERA's current actions are to encourage nature-friendly farming, and I will try to provide an overview of our direction of travel in terms of how we integrate uh, nature-friendly farming as part of future agricultural policy considerations. The committee has received a written update on this latter part, um, so our, my oral presentation this morning will really focus more on what DERA is currently doing. So just before I pass across to Dave to update the committee on that, I'd like to say a few words just quickly on the development of future agricultural policy. Again, this is something that um, the committee is already very aware of, and Minister Poots has set out his vision for future agriculture in Northern Ireland defined around four outcomes, an industry that pursues increased productivity as a means of sustained profitability, an industry that is environmentally sustainable in terms of its impact on and its guardianship of air quality, water quality, soil health, carbon footprint and biodiversity, an industry that displays improved resilience, and an industry which operates within an efficient, sustainable, responsive supply chain. Within the department, we want to help the farm sector to be the best that it can be across these four areas. 
um, and a significant amount of work has been ongoing since the beginning of this calendar year, looking at how we would take that forward. Nature-friendly farming is central to it, and future policy must allow farmers to have the best possible tools at their disposal to deliver these outcomes, and particularly the environmental outcomes. Business as usual for many farms will not be an option. Uh, the future is about doing more with less in a sustainable and innovative way, meeting the many targets that are going to come upon us via legislation. And I know the committee this morning has already made reference to its collation or its um, call for evidence around the climate change bill. We do look forward to engaging with you as a committee on DERA's proposals over the coming months, but I am limited in what I can say today because some of them have not even been fully considered by the minister at this stage, but I'm happy to take any questions you have. So I want to hand over to Dave really for the main focus of our presentation this morning around what we're currently doing. So over to you, Dave. Okay, uh, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, members, for the opportunity to speak to you today about their uh, support for nature friendly farming. Uh, protecting and enhancing biodiversity and wildlife is a key priority for DERA, and as is the delivery of uh, increased opportunities for nature friendly farming. So, uh, if you're content, uh, Chair, I'll give a general overview of the support the department currently offers in relation to nature friendly farming. So firstly, um, DERA's current agri-environment scheme, the Environmental Farming Scheme, supports farmers and land managers to implement environmentally beneficial actions on agricultural land. Uh, its primary aim is to protect and enhance biodiversity and water quality, and also to mitigate against climate change by enabling a greater sequestering of carbon. Uh, EFS is a voluntary scheme. Uh, it offers farmers a, a five-year agreement to implement environmental measures and actions on their land. There are two levels to EFS. Uh, the higher level aims to protect and enhance environmentally designated land and priority habitats. That is achieved through site-specific management plans, which are usually focused on grazing regimes and habitat management measures. These plans are drawn up by an independent environmental planner and are then approved by DERA for implementation by the farmer. The second level of EFS, the wider level, aims to create green infrastructure in the wider countryside outside of the land that's already in a high level. A range of options here are available, including creation of new hedgerows, planting of feed crop for wild birds, creating riparian margins, and also creation of wildland margins. This wider level provides farmers with a menu of options from which they can select up to four different options to form an EFS agreement. Uh, EFS also offers standalone options that support organic farming uh, the production of Irish moil cattle and small woodland creation. Farmers can choose to implement these options along with a range of other options as part of an overall agreement, or they can choose to implement these options individually. In terms of the current status of EFS, after four annual intakes, uh, we have 4, 000, sorry, around 5,000 farmers currently participating in the scheme, which equates to approximately 900 higher level agreements and 4,100 wider level agreements in place, which covers in total around 55,000 hectares of land. Two further tranches are planned for this year and next. Uh, tranche five of the higher level is currently open and applications for this close tomorrow and the plan is for tranche five of the wider level to open in mid-August this year. In addition, there are five EFS group level projects currently in place. These projects support cooperative work by agreement holders in specific geographical areas. So the group projects fund external facilitators to provide farmers with additional advisory support to help them in delivering their EFS agreements. Uh, we currently have five EFS group projects in place specifically targeting environmentally designated land, water quality, and priority habitats and species in particular areas. And around 500 farmers are currently supported in these EFS group projects. Turning now to uh, CAFRI, the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise. CAFRI de uh, delivers knowledge transfer, innovation, and technology transfer programs, which aim to improve future performance, sustainability, resilience of the agri-food industry. CAFRI's agri-environment advisors work with farmers to provide advice across all environmental media in which a comprehensive communication strategy is delivered through a variety of training courses, webinars, press articles, and social media. 
This includes a farm advisory newsletter, which is regularly issued to assist farmers in compliance across the entire range of environmental issues on all of our, to all of our businesses in Northern Ireland. In addition, CAFRI deals directly with farmers through the business development groups, which provide a training forum to allow sharing of knowledge through peer-to-peer -peer learning between farmers with the aim of improving technological efficiency and environmental, and environmental performance. Nature-friendly farming techniques are a key component of the environmental business groups. And by the end of March this year, uh, 3,232 farmers and growers had enrolled in a total of 165 business development groups. And that included 20 environmental business development groups. In addition to this, CAFRI is also responsible for delivering training for all EFS participants uh, in, in terms of the environmental requirements of that scheme. Turning briefly to the work of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, uh, NIA is working with a number of partners to develop a series of conservation management plans for our special areas of conservation, uh, involving engagement with key stakeholders over the necessary conservation measures. And these will be largely delivered through nature friendly farming techniques. Looking now at soil analysis, ensuring healthy soils is an essential element of nature friendly farming. And there are currently offers a soil sampling service and training for farmers, which provides them with detailed information on their soils, such as the pH level and nutrient requirements. By optimizing pH and applying slurry, manure and chemical fertilizer in line with crop need, farmers can both maximize crop yields, increase soil fertility and farm profitability, whilst also importantly improving on environmental performance. Finally, Rosemary's briefly mentioned uh, the issue of future agri-environment support. Uh, and as she said, we continue to engage with the farmers and industry around current and future policy development, along with the practical implementation of necessary measures. And that will continue as we move towards delivery uh, of the new agri-policy framework, uh, and which will enable us then to meet our key international and national commitments on climate, environmental issues, and biodiversity. So work is underway to develop future agri-environment policy, uh, and engagements taking place with a variety of stakeholders, including farmers, the agriculture industry, and the environmental sector, to help inform this work. Uh, uh, for instance, initial meetings have taken place with the UFU and with the Nature Friendly Farming Network. So just in summary then, uh, DARE offers a, a range of support measures uh, and uh, aiming to help to deliver and increase nature friendly farming. And uh, Rosemary and I, we're happy to take any questions you might have in relation to what you've heard. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Um, a number of members here want to ask a question, um, but I maybe want to just uh, kick off with a, a question myself. Um, you, you will be very aware that we're, we're currently engaged in the scrutiny of the climate change um, bill. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the things that I've noted from speaking to farmers and from reading articles is that they're Farmers, um, farmers don't know where they sit in terms of whether where they sit on the scale of being carbon carbon neutral. Um, you know, obviously, the the objective of moving towards net zero is to balance your emissions with what you're sequestering. But what what tools are as a department? I'm, I'm aware, for example, especially within dairy, there's the bovis calculator. But what tools uh, and what strategies is the department looking at in terms of Given farmers um, the means to accurately measure what they're emitting and what they're sequestering to work out where where they actually are in terms of that balance. The development of a future agricultural policy, we do have what we refer to within the department as a carbon work stream. Mm -hmm. um, and whilst you know it's fair to say work is is at a very early stage in that work stream. What we're doing is um, looking at how agriculture can meet whatever the target um, is in the future. Um, we're going to have a target for 25 or 30 years ahead, irrespective of, of you know, what happens um, with any of the bills that are currently under consideration. During that period of time, technology will change, new products will come on stream, and we've already seen a number of products for example, feed additives that are undergoing testing, which claim to mitigate um, methane production by ruminants. So agriculture, as you've said, Chair, is uniquely placed to make a contribution. 
um, and to make um, hopefully a significant contribution. But that will involve change at farm business level. And whilst we can't give you the tools yet, but we are exploring a number of tools and levers um, from you, the use of soil and the measuring of soil and soil carbon and organic matter. And, and I'll ask Dave to add a few more comments on that in a few minutes in our future agricultural policy to try as quickly as we can to assist farmers um, by incentivization, by knowledge, um, by the use of calculators that you referred to um, as part of our suite of tools that we'll take forward on future ag policy. But we're still at an early development stage on those, but we are moving at pace. Um, and it is something that we would like over the next number of months, um, probably if, if I was to give you a date early in your autumn, um, calendar to come and talk to you in more detail about. Dave, is there anything you would like to add to that? I, I suppose just to to add that um, certainly the department is is very aware that you know a, a key to improving environmental performance and, and profitability of farms is is giving farmers the right information uh, to enable them to make the you know, informed decisions. Um, and Rosemary mentioned soils, and certainly a couple of years ago, uh, as a result of the recommendations of the expert working group, um, the department ran two pilot schemes uh, in terms of soil sampling to provide detailed information on soil nutrients and, and also um, information on the pathways that uh, nutrients might take to enter water courses um, using LIDAR. Uh, and certainly the ministers on, on the record, I think, are saying he'd like to roll that out further uh, right across Northern Ireland to enable farmers to have a baseline of information. And as part of that consideration, we're working on proposals for the minister on that. And that would include, you know, both nutrients, but also soil carbon and also uh, above ground biomass. Uh, so that would start to, you know, fill in those gaps and give farmers information uh, both on nutrients on their farms, but also, you know, carbon uh, and, and biomass so that they can start to find out where they are, as you say, chair in terms of carbon neutrality and, and, and how they can move forward. Yeah, yeah. I just want to emphasise that there. You know, in order to to move forward, I do believe farmers need to have a baseline. They need to know where they're currently standing. You know, and obviously, you know, there there is conflicting reports out there. On one hand, you're hearing that uh, farmers have to cut their livestock in order to reduce emissions, and then on the other hand, I've read other reports from uh, from a I've seen from a professor, Alice Stanton, there lately, who believes that many farms are already carbon neutral. So I think that the department owes that to the farmers, that they need to come up with that calculator where, where they can give farmers the tools to work out uh, where they currently, what is their baseline. And then we don't have to look, you know, if you look to South of Ireland, for example, they developed their marginal abatement uh, cost curve, with their 26 action point plan to help farmers along that along that path as well. So I think it'd be important for the department to, you know, look 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 in every direction, but also get some, you know, obviously the south will be slightly further forward on us and that there. But but there is there is a template there as well, you know, and it'd be really really I think it'd be really helpful and really useful because. You know, we share the same farming characteristics across the island of Ireland, and I think it would be useful to, uh, you know, have that close partnership to look at what they're doing in the south to see what we can learn here for the northern part of the island. Chair, if I, if I could just respond on that, I absolutely agree with you, um, and I should have referred to when I answered you earlier, there is currently a European Innovation Partnership programme um, ongoing across Northern Ireland using six farms, and admittedly it's only six, so it's a start, looking exactly at measuring the carbon across those farms and how best to measure it. And that is something that the carbon work stream of future agricultural policy is looking at carefully. So couldn't agree with you more. Um, we need to provide the baseline information to farmers. We need to help farmers understand that information um, to meet whatever the obligations will be moving forward, whether it be net zero carbon in 2045 or 2050, or as the Climate Change Committee's report said, 82% of the way, whatever that target may be, it doesn't really matter, but farmers need the information. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, today we're just not in a position 
because it's part of active policy development and obviously we'll have to take the minister's views um, and look at what he wants to do as well. We're not in a position to talk in any detail about those proposals today, but more than happy to come back in due course. But I am being truthful with you. I would suspect it would be in the autumn um, term of the committee when we'd be in a position to come and talk to you about that. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad to know that that works underway because, you know, um, we all would have got a lot of representation recently from farmers who are very anxious mm-hmm. about uh, what the shape of future policies and uh, and legislation might mean for their business. And they hear they hear many different conflicting stories from um, having to slice their herds to um, and other stories that it, uh, you know that that they can't take reasonable steps. But it, it is absolutely crucial at some juncture that the department gives that certainty. Let farmers work out where that where their baseline is and what is the uh, what is a manageable, manageable map road plan to help them transition forwards? Uh, folks, I'm, I'm going to just move. Thanks very much. I'm going to just move around the room here. Uh, f- uh, Philip? Hi. Mm, hi, Philip. Yes, Philip. Very much. Did you hear that? Uh, you, you actually talked on some of the things that I, that I, that I was going to ask. Uh, but, uh, I mean, just, just I know Rosemary has said that the they can't go into detail uh, in terms of future plans, but I mean, we heard recently from members of Nature Farming Friendly Network, uh, and they referenced that uh, a less is more approach to livestock production can deliver improved uh, profitability for farm businesses, particularly in upland areas. And I know in your introduction, Rosemary, you, you kind of touched on the less is, is more. So, can, can I ask, is future agriculture policy? Uh, I mean, will it help more farmers to adopt uh, this kind of particular approach to improve farm profitability, which is obviously vital, uh, and also the environment, which again is vital? Okay. Um, Thank you, Philip. Um, Well, I I won't repeat them, but um, during my introduction, I I did say over the four outcomes, which I think committee are very aware of, that our future agricultural policy is seeking to achieve around increased productivity. an environmentally sustainable and a resilient business. Um, What I would say is that, you know, by maximizing productivity, we want to maximize the output for a given level of input. In other words, improve efficiency on farms. And if you improve efficiency in farms, you can deliver quite very significant environmental benefits. Things like um, calving a cow at two years of age, perhaps finishing cattle at a younger age so they're on the farm less time. So there's lots of things that can be done to deliver positive environmental benefits. If we look at biodiversity, which is really the subject, I suppose, of what we're here to talk about today, the types of animals that are used to graze certain habitats, the stocking density, all of that is being looked at again within the department to try to deliver both the productivity and the environmental outcomes that we're trying to seek to achieve. But as I said, we're not at a stage yet where we can come forward with, here's what we think as a department, what we hope to do um, early in the autumn, which is why I'm mentioning the autumn to you, is subject to minister's agreement um, to come out with further engagement and consultation documents around our policy proposals um, to try to talk about all of that. But that is subject to minister's agreement. Um, So it's really, it's a start of a conversation and we have a way to go. But do remember, these targets are not tomorrow's targets on climate change. They're targets for 25 to 30 years down the road. So we need to get it right, and we need to spend some time to try to get it right. Um, Dave, anything you want to add? No, I think, um, you know, know, in the original... um, um, policy framework consultation uh, 18 months or so ago, you know, there was a recognition, in, you know, in terms of those four outcomes that we're aiming to achieve around environmental sustainability, um, of the importance of that. And, that, you know, if we can get to a stage where, you know, farmers are rewarded, you know, for their positive work in terms of environmental performance uh, and start to see, you know, the environmental elements of their farm actually, you know, acting almost as a, an income source for, you know, for their environmental management, um, then that, you know, it enables farmers to, uh, you know, remain profitable uh, whilst at the same time uh, d- delivering improved environmental performance and, you know, contributing to the challenges we, we face on climate change. 
So, you know, some of those conversations, you know, we've been having with, with different groups, uh, you know, would, would, would certainly under, underline that. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Chair, that's me, Don. Thank you, Philip. Um, John, John Blair. We can see you, John. And you thought, thanks to Rosemary and Dave as well. And, and good, good to see them uh, give, giving some more information around nature friendly farming. And well, we know that the committee's uh, exploring other avenues as well. So hopefully, we'll start to to progress um, some actions around this. Um, question I want to ask, Chair, is basically that around previous stakeholder engagement which highlighted uh, future agriculture, uh, agriculture policy that would be focused around targeted outcomes related to the environment, um, actions around ammonia emissions, improvements in the condition of priority sites, water quality and, and other environmental targets. C can we ask at this stage if these outcomes will be aligned to specific legal targets or will they be more broad aspirational based? Um. John, thank you. I'll maybe pass that one across to Dave. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, you know, we've been looking at you know the the, the targets, the metrics, uh, you know, in, in relation to the developing future agricultural policy uh, that, that Rosemary's outlined. You know, and there'll be a mixture. You know, there'll be some high level targets that, that you know, know apply to the the whole policy framework, and then some of the individual work streams will have more specific targets. Um, you know, Rosemary's mentioned the carbon work stream. There's also a specific work stream looking at agri environment. Um, and obviously, they're the most uh, relevant in terms of um, environmental targets, and and those will, will flow from you know a, a number of places. But you know, for instance, we have PFG, uh, the program for government, uh, has uh, I think seven currently environmental indicators, uh, which almost all flow from legal obligations, uh, and some of those are certainly relevant when it comes to you know agriculture uh, agricultural policy. You know, in in terms of nutrients, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, so we're relevant. Um, you know, targets will reflect you know the, the, the statutory obligations, um, and we're also being cognizant of the work that's going on in the UK Environment Bill in relation to uh, the Office of Environmental Protection and the requirement uh, to produce an environmental improvement plan, which will be part of our consultation going forward on the environment strategy uh, once that's developed later on in the spring and summer. So there's certainly a recognition within the, the, the agri framework that you know, there needs to be targets to measure progress. Uh, and when it comes to the environment, a lot of those have a strategy basis from you know national and international commitments. Okay, but but I suppose what I'm trying to get to, and I understand that the uh, the commitment which has to exist to, to current legal obligations, but are, are we likely to see additional legal obligations other than those that currently exist? Well, I, I think, Chair, if I come back on that one, the most obvious one um, that I think we're going to see is a is a legal commitment to um, a climate change. Yeah. Um, uh, the target. No, that, that is the most obvious one. But um, at this stage, I think, you know, all we can say is that we are looking at the targets, we're looking at the metrics, and certainly any future agricultural policy will have a number of targets that are set in statute. But associated to that, it will have a number of metrics, um, probably at the higher level, a number of very, a small number of quite significant metrics that the future agricultural policy is seeking to achieve, which is the outcome and how we measure it. So it's an outcome-focused policy. It's not an activity-related one. It's an outcome-focused one. And we will have to develop a monitoring and evaluation framework around how we actually measure that we're achieving those outcomes as we move forward. So whether or not those are put in legislation at this stage, um, we haven't come to any formal decision. Um, obviously, that needs consideration with the minister as well, and we're just not at that stage, John. I know it hasn't given you an answer to your question, but it is part of what's going on internally within the policy development function within the department. Okay, that's that, fine. So, so it's it's uh, we're somewhere. I'm, I'm not quite content. It's, it's work in progress. Stroke, wait and yes. see, and, and we can we can explore further at a later stage. I'm happy with that. Thanks both. Thank you, John. Uh, 
Okay, thank you for that, John. Uh, I'm going to call in Claire Bailey. Thank you, Chair. Um, and how are you? today again, Claire, but good, good to see you. Hello, you're back today. I'm telling you, it's just Thursday morning, Luke. <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> but I just maybe want to follow on, uh, just you can close your eyes and not look. But listen, follow on from that one. We've known for, we've known about climate crisis for a very long time. And we've also known that carbon and methane are the biggest problems for a very long time. So during some of this time, department policy has deliberately intensified agri-emissions um, through various policies like going for growth, for example, um, without, are you telling us that, that that was all happening without even beginning to build baselines or measures within the sector, that none of that was being done while knowing the problem? Claire, if I'll respond first to that and then I'll ask Dave to comment. Um, we do measure environmental outcomes, and in fact, just today we have met, we have published as a department um, what our environmental indicators are showing, um, and the latest on those. So we do measure baselines. Um, sorry, there seems to be a bit of an echo, but hopefully yeah. you can hear me. Could all members perhaps go on to mute unless we're asking a question, please? Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, so we do measure baselines, and we have been measuring baselines. I think in answer to your question, up until we left the EU, most departmental policy in terms of farm support, and in fact, the very significant majority of it was being driven by the European Common Agricultural Policy under Pillar 1 or Pillar 2, um, because we were a member state as part of the United Kingdom. So it was that policy framework that we followed. Um, the, the funding for that, the delivery of that policy on the ground came from the EU, we're now in a different scenario, so we're looking at our local regional needs more, but I think it's it's not quite accurate to say we haven't been measuring because there are various um, reports and indicators that we have had on an annual basis looking at the environmental outcomes um, and the environmental indicators. So, Dave, I'll just hand across quickly to you. Yeah, I, I suppose just to add to that, um, you know, in, in terms of baseline information for farmers, um, you know, I'd, I'd mentioned previously uh, in, in response to the, the question from the chair, I think, you know, about the the work on soil nutrients and soil carbon uh, and the minister's aspirations around that, and the the that's underpinned by you know two fairly large scale pilot schemes that have taken place and the genesis for those was in, in relation to um the, the work of the expert working group uh, who suggested that you know there was a need for that baseline information um and and then and that was in parallel you know at, at around the time of the going for growth document that came out of the uh, the the um the, the work around that. So, the, 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 you know, I think the recognition that you know baseline information needed to be developed. Um, it, it does take time, uh, particularly when it comes to the, you know land, because we have so much land in agricultural use, uh, and you know we're seeking to expand that now. But uh, it, it will take a while to do that, uh, and you know, conscious now that technology is moving on. Um, and so the information we can provide as a baseline in, in, in going forward in the next few years is, you know, is probably more, much more significantly detailed than we might have been doing two or three years ago. Well, do you think then that this has led to an unsustainable economic agri-food model? Uh, Claire, I sincerely hope not. Um, I, I believe that in order to meet our environmental outcomes that farming and the environment must come together. They can't compete. Um, farmers own a significant, farmers and landowners own a significant amount of the land um, that delivers the environmental outcomes. So we must strive to ensure, as Dave said, that the environment is the centre of that farm moving forward and the environment becomes like an enterprise on that farm almost and you've heard Minister Pitts refer to it as a profit centre. Um, so we need to look at new ways of doing this and we must bring farm economic activity 
and delivering environmental outcomes together because it's only together that they can deliver um, moving forward. And you know, I think that there is a way through this. It may take us some time to get there and we will need a significant amount of engagement as a department. Um, but I think there's still a role. Yeah, yeah. of course there's sure. still a role. That's absolutely essential. But I want to pick up just on that um, healthy soils that Dave mentioned as well. Dave, you were saying that healthy soils are an important factor for nature-friendly farming. But I'd go a wee bit further. So healthy soils are absolutely important for all farming, um, you know, uh, and and much much more. They're really really important for biodiversity and species and habitats as well. But just following that one, then what is happening with CAFRI in terms of shaping education um, courses as well? Is there conversations being had about um, promoting? nature friendly and climate friendly practices within agri education as dave um claire that we would need to take away i i can't education program um, the knowledge advisory service and knowledge programs at cafe are under continual revision and certainly the CAFRI staff are very heavily involved um, in our teams looking at the de delivery or the development of future agricultural policy. But as to specific changes that are envisaged over sort of the, the weeks or the months and the year ahead, I think that would be better a question that we take away and give, get you some more detailed information on it. Um, I don't know, Dave, if you can add anything to that or not. No, I think yeah, it would probably be uh, better to give some detailed follow up on that. But certainly, uh, I can only sort of you know, from my own perspective, I, I know that you know a number of staff I I in the environmental policy side of the department where I work, and also within NIEA, uh, are now you know actively working with CAFRI in terms of the inputs to the various uh, syllabuses and curricula that they offer. Um, you know, uh, inputting directly in terms of you know environmental requirements and sustainability. You know, and so there's a, a good two-way conversation going on there. Um, you know, we can provide details on what that's specifically you know leading to in terms of the detail of CAFRI's programs. But there certainly is a conversation going on, uh, and there has been for quite a while. You know, to make sure that you know that the courses that CAFRI offer, you know, uh, you know, have the, the most up-to-date information in, in relation to environmental requirements and uh, and techniques. Okay, thanks. I'd be appreciated because I did ask um, something similar from the minister last week, um, and he said that he would get back to me as well. But I don't think that I've received that information from him yet either. But it could be wrong. But thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, Morris, go we'll call on Morris. Hi, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation, folks. Uh, as always, I find it interesting. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, is you know, uh, as the current farming practices, uh, and it's wrong, to, I think, to, to solely focus on farming, uh, but the Rivers Agency have uh, a responsibility for overdraining waterways and floodplains, etc. Uh, so that's just some of the reasons for the loss of biodiversity. We've lost 11% of species in Northern Ireland. Uh, we're under threat, and that's right across the island. Reduction of crop rotation, over-reliance on chemicals as fertilizers, pesticides, Pesticides, etc. All these matters need urgent action to change more organic, environmentally friendly methods. However, there is a cost. Where do you think that extra cost should come from to aid the farming industry to adapt to more nature friendly farming? And where do you think that cost may come from, central government, DERA, or where? Because farmers need financial help to become more nature friendly. Um. Again, thank you, Morris. Um, I'll start and then hand across to Dave. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, we need to deliver public goods from farming. Um, that will become more critical moving forward. Um, but we want to deliver productivity as well as those public goods in terms of environmental sustainability. And we need to look at how we incentivize, and I use the word incentivize, farmers to do that. Mm -hmm. Some of it may be through knowledge. Some of it may be through bespoke measures to try to encourage them to change their adopted techniques. Um, in other words, a scheme or a, a funding. But we might be able to do that more by providing them with the knowledge. Um, but it is part of, and again, I go back to, it's part of the policy development work ongoing. How much of this do we do by giving knowledge? How much do we need to incentivize? Or how much do we need to actually do by regulation? 
Obviously, regulation is the final step. If we could do it by the easier, the easier method, that's better. In terms of who pays for it, currently um, all funding that goes to farmers um, comes from Treasury. Um, and as we move forward, we will need to undertake all of the necessary business cases to demonstrate the need for any support we give to farmers. Um, so DERA's budget comes from Treasury, so it's coming from UK government um, anyway, so it will be funded by a UK government. So Dave, anything you'd like to add? No, I, don't, I think you've covered it all. To be honest, Rosemary, pretty much, you know, I'll just you know, emphasise what you said there about the, the mix of you know, techniques to, 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 you know, to bring about the outcomes we want environmentally, um, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, in knowledge and education, um, you know, the, the, the uh, support uh, in, in terms of particular schemes that might enable particular outcomes to be achieved. And then also, you know, the, the, the backstop of regulation. Um, you know, which is used in, in certain cases as well. Um, uh, and, you know, very much in, in trying to seek the, the, the best of those in the particular circumstances, uh, and that might vary. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you very much. Chair, I think it would be wrong if we didn't celebrate the return of the crane to Ireland after an absence of 300 years. Uh, Board of Mona, who have ceased peat extraction uh, and have re-wetted some peatlands, uh, have had an important impact, which is saw the return of this giant bird. I'm not, I'm not sure. I have never seen one, obviously, but I think they're over a metre high and a wingspan of four foot. But this proves that if you re-wet the peatlands, if you re-establish the habitat, that species may return, and not only may return, but we can safeguard the current numbers of others who already exist and are under threat of extinction. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Morris, and I couldn't agree more with you uh, on that. That that was definitely a good news story. Um, I'm going to move round here now over to Strangford to Harry. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Rosemary and Dave, good to see you again. Rosemary, just a wee comment. You opened your comments with you said more for less, but you admitted to say that the farm, farmer should be better paid as well. I think you said all that you comment on. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking your farmer scheme, farming scheme, did you produce a leaflet for that or how did you re relay your information out to the farmers? Obviously, you've had 5,000 participants, so that's obviously been well advertised and spread abroad there. My question to you would be, Rosemary and Dave, how do you cater for different areas having different needs or capabilities? You know, here we're variation in climate, landscape, and soils. I'm just wondering how you address that, too, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um. Thank you, Harry. Um. I think your question around um how do we encourage applications to the or the five thousand applications referred to the environmental farming scheme. So I'll maybe ask Dave to respond on that. In terms of how we cope with the different areas, I think that's a very valid question. And again. It is something we're looking at because obviously there are specific areas of environmental in interest and do they need bespoke environmental measures where farmers, for example, might need to cooperate. And again, Dave can comment on that, but that is something part of our as we're looking at as part of our active consideration at the moment. Dave, um, again, I think there's a bit of an echo chair. Uh, members, again, same thing. Just turn off your microphones if you're not uh, speaking. Yep. Thanks, Rosemary. Uh, I mean, in terms of the uh, environmental farming scheme, I think the department uses a, a variety of different tools, uh, communications tools, to to make farmers aware of of the scheme uh, being open for applications. Whether it's you know via the press or you know, social media, website information at DERA direct offices, uh, and, and the combination of those. Um, and always looking to improve that. Uh, so are there areas where, you know, we haven't been getting the right reach, uh, you know, very happy to hear from that, uh, about that, see what more we could do. But uh, recognising that, you know, farmers need to be aware of something before they can actually avail of it and, and make those choices. In, in terms of the, you know, the, the different requirements in different areas, that's, that's very true. Um, you know, in, in the current scheme, EFS, 
um, you know, it, it is quite bespoke, um, bespoke. So, you know, for the higher applicants, you know, I'd mentioned a, a, a um, environmental planner going out and developing a, a site specific management plan. So that's tailored to the actual locality of the farm. Um, uh, when it comes to wider, um, you know, farmers can choose some, a, 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 a menu of different options um, and, and the IT system that we have uh, has a lot of underpinning geographical information in it. Um, so where we know there are particular areas that might have particular water quality issues, then the, the system can you know, help to uh, point farmers in the direction of perhaps measures that will help with water quality. So uh, you know, the, 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 we use a, a mixture of human beings and technology to try and ensure that you know, the current scheme delivers in a, a very tailored manner for the particular requirements of, of that farm or that area. Um, in, in looking forward for you know the future, uh, I think again you know we're recognising that a one size doesn't fit all, uh, and we've been looking you know in in helping our policy development uh, you know of what's been going on elsewhere in terms of developments, uh, looking at the, the scheme that's recently been launched in England, uh, talking to colleagues in in, in Ireland. Uh, Rosemary mentioned the EIP programmes. Uh, we've also been looking at some life projects, EU life projects that have been delivering quite tailored geographical outcomes to farms. So, um, you know, I think we're, we're very much of the, of the view that, that you know, uh, what, a, what a farmer does needs to reflect the, the needs of, it, of it, or his or her farm. Uh, and the, the, the schemes that the department puts in place need to be able to facilitate that as much as possible. Yep, yep, thank you very much. We're not only a diverse people, but we have a diverse landscape as well. Thank you very much, Chair. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to call in Rosemary. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Declan, and thank you, Rosemary and Dave, for your presentation. Um, mine's just a follow on, actually, from Declan's question in relation to carbon sequestration, etc. You know, in Northern Ireland, we've had, we've referred to the diverse diverse landscape. We also have diverse soils in relation to soil fertility. And um, I, I'm wondering, in relation to that, I, I do believe that within the different, you know, you have farms and lowlands of Fermanagh, farms in the uplands of Antrim, etc. I, I think there needs to be a little bit more um, Less one size fits all work in relation to farming in Northern Ireland. I think we need to be looking at the specific types of farming, the specific areas of farming in relation to carbon sequestration and also in relation to the greenhouse ga gas emissions because we have, um, you know, we have beef animals, we have cows, and then we have sheep, and they, they all produce very different different emissions and I think we need to be, is there any work being done that's going to uh, look towards more individualizing the work on farms or for the farmers? Well, I, I suppose, Rosemary, I have to start um, and thank you for your question. By answering that around, we have to look at what the balance is because if we try to tailor future agricultural support to 24 and a half individual farms, DARA will never deliver that support. Um, it will be so cost intensive. Um, it, it, it won't deliver the outcomes we're seeking to achieve for the department or for the farmer. So, but there is merit in what you say, looking at farm types and what might be um, the various levers that we could use with different farm types to deliver for carbon. And that is part of the work on the carbon work stream. Um, now, how we would take that forward, we're just not at a stage we can talk about yet. Um, we haven't got that far, but it is part of what the carbon work stream will do under the agricultural policy. Look at, and I mentioned earlier, you know, if we calve cows at two years of age as opposed to two and a half years of, or sorry, calf heifers at two years of age as opposed to two and a half years of age, that has a positive benefit on um, the climate. If we finish animals sooner, that has a positive impact on the environment, and that's all around increased productivity. So it could be, and I only say it could be, that we would have a menu of things that we would 
suggest that farmers need to comply with as they move forward. That's only suggest at this stage in order to receive their payments moving forward, a way to help incentivize. But the beginning of that, as we've talked about, is trying to transfer knowledge, knowledge on the baseline and knowledge to farmers on how they achieve these things. It wouldn't come into that regulation phase unless we weren't seeing some improvement. But it is part of active consideration. But I think the balance has to be struck over what we can achieve and what we can actually deliver. So, Dave, anything to add? Just uh, I mean uh, on the um, on the science side of things, I suppose um, uh, you, you're quite right, Rosemary. That you know it, 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 the industry is a diverse industry, and and the the, the landscape is a diverse landscape. Um, and certainly, we work very closely with with AFP uh, and, and other science providers, and the the greenhouse gas inventory, which is you know the 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 the, the overall measurement of our progress. In relation to climate change, you know, we, we spend a, a lot of effort to ensure that the Northern Ireland inputs to that from all sectors, not just agriculture, but we're talking about agriculture today is as, as up to date and as accurate as can as can be. And, and, you know, and if we think that, you know, assumptions that have been made for other parts of the UK don't apply here, then we, we seek to gather the science to ensure that, you know, that's reflected and updated in the inventory. Um, in, in relation to the soils, you know, we mentioned the minister's desire to to to, to roll out uh, wider scale soil sampling, uh, and in doing that, we recognise that soil types, you know, are very varied across Northern Ireland, uh, and if we're going to start to measure car soil carbon as well as soil nutrients, then we need to have the test that will give an accurate reflection of that, no matter what the soil type. And you know, and so we've been talking with AFB to recognising that you know certain parts of Northern Ireland we might need to do some development work to make sure our testing is fit for purpose, uh, in order to make sure that we are you know accurate and fair to all different uh, parts of the industry and and all the different landscape and environmental types across Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, th and just just one more question. My question is in relation to genetics of livestock, you know, and how to improve the economy and environmental performance of grazing livestock. You know, I heard I heard Rosemary refer to uh, the quick the quicker the finishing of animals, perhaps the better, the better for obviously for G greenhouse gas emissions. But then that's in contrast to the farming of our native breeds, such as our Dexters. So we have to maybe take cognizance of what, try and get a balance between our, what are our native breeds and the use of them and then what we would call the foreign breeds that we're already using in our, on our farms. Um, you know, Rosemary, totally agree with you. I was only giving you at that stage yeah. a few examples of what we could do. So, you know, I, one of the areas that we are starting again to look at um, is to look at how the, the genetics and, the, and a livestock data program could be embedded sort of within a future agricultural policy framework to improve not just the environmental performance, but the economic performance. And there will be different solutions for different farms on different landscapes, given the diversity. But it's trying to, to suggest what that would be at this stage. We're not at a point where we could suggest that. I can give you examples today, and I don't disagree at all with the examples you gave me. But we're not at, at a stage even of coming forward with those policy proposals. OK. Thank you. Um, William? Thank Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, William. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm a farmer myself, so I believe the vast majority of farmers want to play their part in relation to doing what they can uh, in relation to nature-friendly farming. But I'm sure you would accept that they do need help, they need support, they need guidance in relation to this all. Um, certainly they're not the experts, they want to play their part, but they do need clear guidance from government and the department in relation to that. Um, and the sooner that can be done, the sooner that guidance comes forward, the better. Well, I think, William, you know, we acknowledge your comment, and I think we've probably, um, in the responses that Dave and I have given, we've, we've indicated that knowledge yeah. is a huge part of that and guidance and incentivization. So, totally recognize that. Would you accept that 
on the, in relation to climate change, the Climate Change Committee uh, come forward with recommendations. All the rest of the UK regions accepted their findings and recommendations. Do you, would you agree with me that it's wise that Northern Ireland should do similar? Um, Chair, I think it's probably our better that I don't comment on that because I don't lead on climate change and neither does Dave. Um, but it's suffice to say that you know the department is undertaking its own analysis of the various um, proposals that are out there, and our colleagues will be coming forward to the committee um, to give you their views on that. So what you're saying, the department will be taking, will be looking at the, the recommendations made by the climate change committee. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, right, folks, we need to urgently move on because we're under pressure. Claire, you have a very short question, and can we get a very short answer? Is that all right? Claire? Yeah, hi. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for letting me in again. But listen, Rosemary, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about measurements and baselines and how you do collate um, statistics, and you mentioned the Northern Ireland Environment Statistics Report there. So uh, I had a week ago just noted that the 2021 report was out this morning. Um, yes. And it was published, and it shows absolutely no improvement in our water quality, nor any reduction at all in our greenhouse gas emissions. So I just wanted to put that on the record. You know, how can we have any faith? You know, there's a lot of talk going on, but little action to redress the harms being done. Well, I think all, all I can say on that point in my role on future agricultural policy, those are the baseline figures that we're looking at. We have set a series of outcomes and we're now looking um, very seriously at what we can do to mitigate against um, the fact that those indicators are not changing. But remember, agriculture isn't the only sector that influences water quality, for example. So, you know, I, it's not all down to agriculture. Okay. Um, I th thank you, Rosemary. I, um, I, I don't want to disrupt that I disrupt this too much, but I really need to move on to the next item because we have people waiting for us. So uh, um, I want to thank you very much for coming this morning, Rosemary and Dave. Really, really helpful and really, really informative. Okay. So um, good morning to you. Okay, or good afternoon now, the States. Thank you. All right. Okay, members. Um, I'm going to move on very quickly. Number eight is a, a written briefing on the Spring Traps Approval Order 2021, uh, page 69 year packs. The purpose of the order is to update the list of the makes and models of spring traps that are authorised for use here. The order adds a type of spring trap to those approved for use, namely the Perdix spring trap. The order also adds to the target species, for which two of the traps previously approved may be used. All the amendments are technical in nature and do not introduce any change in policy. Be, the, the SR will be laid under a negative resolution and is anticipated to come into operation in September 2021. Uh, are members okay with the merits of the policy and move to the next stage, or if you have any issues with it? Or... Okay. Okay, members, um, I'm going to move then now to the uh, I'm going to move the meeting into a closed session to discover to to discuss. Should be us in open uh, session now, Chair. Uh, we're back in open session here, members. We're at item number 11, correspondence. I want to refer members to correspondence received at page 149. Uh, I want to draw attention to correspondence in relation to the importation of bees at 150. And we'll recall that, this, that, that an update was requested at last week's meeting. I also want to draw attention to correspondence from the Department regarding the LOCNA COVID-19 support scheme, which was launched by the Minister on the 29th of April and is now open for applications with the closing uh, date of the 31st of May. I want to bring Chair, members... Chair. Um, oh, sorry. Who, who, who's that? Rosemary here. Rosemary. Just, sorry, Rosemary. Uh, no. Chair, I just want to express, express my concern that we had... Uh, Loch Erin fishermen who lost who lost their jobs as a result as, mm -hmm. as a result of um, uh, being reduced the eel the eel uh, fisheries over the eel fishing in Loch Erin and they got no compensation. I just want to express my concern at that. Um, do you want Rosemary? Do you want maybe to, to for us to note that and and and, and forward it to the department? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for raising that, Rosemary. Um, 
Okay, members, I want to advise members that there is an item tabled correspondence from the Executive Committee on an SR outlining transfer of powers laid by the Executive Office with particular transfer of functions for the Department for Infrastructure of certain functions of DERA, namely the Reservoir Bill. Are we okay with the transfer of powers outlined? Okay. Um, there's also a, 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 there was a piece of correspondence uh, at page 172, uh, outlining plan changes to the cross uh, compliance uh, regime. Uh, this will result in reduced fines for first non compliance offences, reduction in fine multiplier for repeat intentional offences, and reduction in penalties for permanent negligence breaches or for on farm low effect and off farm very low effect offences. Um, as, um, I think maybe on, on that one there, maybe, you know, uh, to just give you a bit of clarity from the department in terms of non-regression, because obviously, you know, there's uh, there would be perhaps environmental concerns, you know, uh, if the regime was became too relaxed, you know, and there has been a number of environmental issues in recent years. So I think maybe it would be okay to give you a bit of clarity from the department in terms of non-regression on that issue. Yep. I'll export that. Okay. And are members content to action the correspondence suggested in the index sheet of page 146? Okay. Um, okay. Members, item number 12 is the forward work program, uh, page 305. Um, I want to advise members that the departmental briefing uh, on the consultation and the protection of service animals has been deferred at the request of the department to the meeting of the 27th of May. And are we okay with the forward work program? Okay. Okay, members, um, the last item of business before we adjourn is the any other business. Is there any other specific issues people want to raise? Uh, well, yes, Chair. Okay. Rosemary and then Philip. Yes, Rosemary? Um, when we were looking at the oral evidence from raise, there was it was mentioned about legal advice. I'm wondering, is it possible to ask for that legal advice before we move on? Yeah, I, I think that would be fair enough. Yeah, Are members agreed. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, that's okay, Rosemary. Members agreed there. Philip, you want to come in on something there? Philip? Yep. Yeah, go ahead, yep. Philip. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I just want to welcome the Rural uh, Halls Fund announced yesterday by the Minister. I mean, it's obviously a, a fund and grant that should help uh, help many local voluntary and community organisations fund much needed refurbishment to rural halls and, and keep uh, community facilities viable. But I'm sure we will all remember the justifiable negative experience and controversy of a similar, similar fund, the Community Halls Fund set up by Paul Given. Uh, from a number of years back that seemed to benefit uh, Orange Halls over and above other types of community GA-type uh, premises. So I think, I mean, from the committee's point of view, we, we should be satisfied that this rural hall fund is, is something that will be open and accessible to all rural communities and groups right across the north. So I, I don't remember the details of the scheme coming before the committee. I could be wrong on that. But for cer certainly from scrutiny point of view, I would suggest that we write to the department uh, and ask for assurances that this fund uh, will be distributed fairly to all sections of the community. Okay, members okay with that there? Um, okay, and uh, uh, pa pa Patsy, Patsy has had to move on to our meeting, but I know that maybe perhaps Patsy raised it earlier on, he had raised con some concerns about the potential um, impact of the uh, the UK Australian trade deal uh, on, well on the British market and the impact the knock on impact for our farmers here. Could, could members tell me when I was out in the pipe earlier, did Patsy raise that today? He he did raise that? Sure I did. I'm uh, still here at uh, oh, sorry, Patsy. <laughs> I'm about to go because if somebody texted me here you you needed this or anything. So yeah, thanks very much indeed. I did raise it earlier. Um, it, it would be useful, perhaps, if we could get a briefing from the department whenever they're at a stage to give us a briefing on this as to what um, input they've had to DEFRA and to other, other departments over at Westminster about the implications of this because it would have 
potentially serious implications. We heard earlier about the importation of goods, agri-food sector and farm produce from the north here over into the GB markets. And uh, 70% of our of our food is uh, of our food produce is exported and 50% goes over to GB. So yeah. if, if they're bringing in cheap foods, that there would have major implications altogether. So um, if we could, if I can make that recommendation, and I hope others would, would uh, support it, is that we get an update from the department as to what input they've made about this to, to um, voice their concerns on, on behalf of the agri-food and farm sector. Yeah, I, I, I fully, you're 100% right, Patsy, there. You know, that, that stark, the fact that, uh, okay, we export 70, 50% of all the food produced here is sold in the British market, and that's massively, that's huge. You know, so I think that's really important that we make representation to Deira in the first instance, and possibly uh, DEFRA as well, uh, if, you know, we'll see what Deira says when we come back. Does that be fair enough, Patsy? Right. Right. Thanks, Thanks for All the best. Take care, right. Mike. Um, okay, members. Um, okay, members. Next meeting is next Thursday, twenty seventh of May, at ten o'clock. And again, it'll be a hybrid meeting streamed on the assembly website. And I hope you're back in Parliament buildings and doing it online today, as a result of a previous appointment uh, hadn't applied for. And um, so, thank you very much, folks. We're going to adjourn the meeting. So we'll see you all next week, or I'll see you in the chamber during the week. Okay. Take care now. Good luck. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.